Hey everyone, uh, in this short video, I'm going to show you how to do a meta-analysis. Now, a lot of this is based on my recent paper, which has just come out. Um, now, there's a whole lot to meta-analysis, such as pre-registration, putting together a protocol, data collection, which I go through uh, in this paper. But today, I'm just going to be going over the analysis bit. Now, you can do your analysis in programs such as SPSS using macros or comprehensive meta-analysis, uh, but these are really expensive and it's difficult to share the scripts for how you did your analysis. So today, I'm gonna to show you how to do your analysis in R, which is free, and it's very easy to share the analysis scripts, which encourages reproducible science, which is a great thing. Now, the script that I'll be using today is available uh, with my new paper, uh, or you can go to my GitHub site and download and follow along. So uh, here's the site here, um, and you can, uh, click here and get access to the scripts. Now, let's have a look at the script here. So the first thing we'll be doing is installing the required packages here. There's three packages we're gonna be using, RubyMeta, Metaphor, and dplyr. Now the data that we're gonna be using actually comes with Metaphor. Okay, now everything's loaded up. The first thing we're going to do is uh, use this command to load the data and create a new object called uh, dat. Next thing we're going to do is add a study ID column. This is basically an extra column which numbers each study from 1 to 16. And finally, we're going to move the study ID column to the front using a dplyr function. Okay, let's have a look at the data. So you can see here we have uh, 16 studies and um, with this we have the year it was published, the uh, number of participants in each study and Pearson's R value. And we also have a few other measures here which we're gonna use as um, uh, moderator analyses, in our, in our moderator analyses. And back to the script. So the first thing we wanna do is transform our R um, Pearson R values to Fisher Z um, and uh, calculate the corresponding symbol variances. Now the reason we're doing that is that uh, R values are not normally distributed. So in order to do the meta-analysis, we need to actually convert our values to Z values or Fisher Z values. So let's do that now. If we look at the file again, we can see these two values have been added on the end. Now we're ready to perform the analysis using a random effects model. So using these commands, we'll print out the data and also calculate the confidence intervals uh, for the amount of heterogeneity. On this first command. Okay, now we have our first uh, set of analysis, but uh, we'll continue on. Okay, so the output here gives us important information uh, to report the meta-analysis. So we'll look at it section by section. First line um, tells us that it's a random effects model. We uh, included uh, 16 effect sizes and um, we calculated the um, uh, meta-analysis using a restricted, a restricted ma maximum likelihood estimator. This line here, shows us that uh, task squared was 0 0.008 and that our um, heterogeneity was uh, 61.73. So in other words, 62.73 of the variation reflected actual differences in the population mean. We also have our test for heterogeneity here. As this Q statistic is statistically significant, um, this suggests that the included studies do not share a common effect size. And we'll scroll down to our model results. And the estimate here provides the estimated model coefficient, so the summary effect size. So we can see here that the estimate is uh, 0.14 or 0.15 if you round up. And the p-value was uh, statistically significant. We also have the um, confidence intervals here, which are quite handy to have right down here. Now these ones, what they do is, uh, this actually reflects the 
uh, transformation of Fisher Z back to Pearson's R, which is what we're going to use for reporting, along with the 95% confidence intervals. And these lines here give us our estimates and confidence intervals for heterogeneity measures. So while the uh, heterogeneity measures that we've calculated do give us evidence for heterogeneity, they don't actually give us information about the studies, which studies may be influencing overall heterogeneity. So what you can do is you can um, put together what's called a Bajout plot. Now, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but um, I've given it a red-hot go. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a new meta-analysis, um, which includes the study ID identifier that we added in to begin with. And the next thing we're going to do is put together this plot. So if we zoom in, we can actually see the studies which uh, potentially influenced our analysis here. So study 10 and study 12, and we'll look back. So it was the Durant et al. study and Eau Cleric. Now having a closer look at these characteristics might reveal some moderating variables that could contribute to this heterogeneity. So on top of this, there's some uh, diagnostic tests we can use to identify uh, outliers in influential cases. So let's run that analysis. We get some figures here. And uh, this is just visualizing this data set down here. Now, any studies which are potentially influential are marked with an asterisk, but uh, we don't have that here. So none of the studies fulfilled the criteria as an influential study. Now, what we're going to do is visualize our meta-analysis with the forest plot by running this script here. So if we take a close look, we can see how each of these studies contributed to the summary effect size. Now, the bounds of this diamond here represent the 95% confidence interval, which is also shown on the side here. But you can actually see it's really interesting to look at which studies um, contributed to this uh, overall effect size here. Now the next thing we're going to do is have a look at the potential issue of publication bias. First thing we'll do is create a funnel plot which visualizes a standard error against the correlation coefficient. Now, what we're looking for is any cases of asymmetry between these two sides here. Now, looking at this sample here, it looks uh, fairly symmetrical between the two sides. But that's quite subjective. Um, but fortunately, we do have some objective tests of bias. Um, Eggers regression test and the rank correlation test, which I'm going to run now. Now, as you can see here, neither Eggers regression test or the rank correlation test was uh, significant. So there's no evidence that we have publication bias, at least according to these tests. Now, that's uh, kind of boring. So what I've done is I've actually created a data set which has simulated bias. I've removed three studies with small effect size and high standard error. Um, so going back to my GitHub script, no, sorry, my GitHub page, um, that bias is a file, and the dat mes is a file you also need for future. Now, these files are also um, a supplementary material as part of my paper. So, put those files in your working directory, which you can actually see the files here. Now, let's bring in those files, and we'll have a look. So here's the dat bias. And let's run the meta-analysis as before. And we'll look at the funnel test and the uh, Eggers regression test and the rank correlation test. Okay, pretty clear asymmetry. There's many more studies on this side and there's no studies around down here. So visually, it looks like there's evidence of publication bias.
Now let's look at the tests. Here we can see both tests are statistically significant. So we do have evidence of publication bias here. So what we can do is uh, we can apply the trim and fill method to impute these so-called missing studies to create a more symmetrical final plot. So by using these commands here, what we've done is we've imputed these studies here, making this plot much more symmetrical. Now finally, what we're going to do as, is to look at the potential role of moderators using a meta-regression model. First thing we want to do is to see what the moderating effect of age is. So we'll look here. And once we look at this test of moderators line, we can see because the p-value was greater than 0.05, that there's evidence that age did not significantly moderate the observed correlation that we have. Now remember we had a measure of quality, study quality here, that each study got, either ranked from 1, 2, or 3. So same sort of thing. No evidence here by looking at this p-value that study quality moderated the overall uh, effect size. Now finally, we'll look at the moderating effect of whether variables were controlled for in the studies. So they were either none or multiple variables controlled for. Okay, as we can see, there was a significant effect here. So it looks like that uh, controlling for variables significantly moderated the observed correlation that we found. Now, one situation you may find yourself in is where a single study is contributing multiple effect sizes. Now, this could actually uh, affect your uh, overall result um, because these effects are actually dependent on one another because they came from the same population. So, to simulate this, I've created a, a new data set that.mes, which you'll also find as the supplementary material for the paper. Let's load it in and we'll have a look. Okay, so what I've done here, the first three studies I've assumed uh, are put together as if they're the same. So we have one study and we have three effect sizes from this one study or this one group. Now we'll run the meta-analysis as before. And now we're going to fit the meta-regression model with correction, with all, we're also having correction for small sample size, which is good for any meta-analyses under, say, uh, 40. So looking at the output, we can see that there were um, 16 outcomes, but 14 studies. And uh, we also have a statistically significant point estimate here. So, thanks for listening. Uh, make sure you check out the paper and all the associated data with it.